Heavenly Father, we thank you. We pray that your Holy Spirit, that you quieten our hearts, prepare our hearts, so that we may not just hear and learn more, but that we may hear and receive your word that is spoken into our hearts. Lord, may the words of my heart, meditation of my mind, be pleasing unto you. We thank you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's read uh, today's word together uh, before we hear. And then today we are up to uh, chapter 6, book of Daniel, and chapter 6. And then we are not going to read a whole section. We're going to try reading uh, four verses, verses 3 to 5 and verse 10. And let's read these verses together. Okay, let's read it together. Then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. And the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. Then the high officials and the satraps sought to find a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom. But they could not find no ground for complaint or any fault because he was faithful and no error or fault was found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. Verse 10, we are going to also read together. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. Amen. Amen. We're going to the book of Daniel and then we have a few more Sundays as we are focusing on uh, what it means for us to live as a spiritual people, God's people, in a very secular world. And then we've been going through, especially the first five chapters, now the sixth chapter, biographical (coughs) biographical stories of Daniel, which really teaches us and challenges us in many ways. And then from next Sunday, we'll be looking at some other section where it speaks a lot more about prophecies and then other visions that he has seen. How you and I are to live as salt and the light in the world. Now, I love uh, the person Daniel and the name Daniel. Uh, in fact, I name uh, two of our, my kids, the, their middle name is Daniel. Uh, my daughter, her middle name is Danielle, and then my son, his middle name is Daniel. Uh, because we both, my wife and I, really love uh, this person, Daniel, who really, really exemplified, who is an excellent model for us as to how we ought to live in the midst of the world. You see that he was not a pastor, he was not a missionary, he was a, a you know, government worker, uh, he was a public servant, but, but he was somebody that God used to have a, a big impact and uh, making a kingdom impact in a big way. I hope that you and I will continue to learn how we can, you can, be like Daniel, where God has placed you. You know, the favorite story you know, of Daniel, uh, for me, is this story. And probably even non-Christian and even a lot of young people and probably uh, heard the story of uh, Daniel uh, in the lion's den. It's a very popular story. And then up until recently, my favorite part about the the Daniel story, and especially this story, was uh, uh, verses 3 to 5 where it speaks about how, you know, the king put, you know, the 120 governors and on top of them, three administrators, and then Daniel was one of them, and then how Daniel so distinguished himself. And so that others were jealous, but but he was living a life in such, uh, with uh, integrity, so that other people could not find any, any ground of fault, or any other things that they could complain about. He lived a life of integrity, a a model where you and I need to really learn a lot about and how we can become more like him. 
You know, it has been a, a section that really helped me to think a lot about how you and I need to be more like Daniel in that way. But as I was looking at it, you know, especially in NIV, you know, the using the word so distinguished, and then, and then also how he was trustworthy in everything that he did, and then how there was no corruption in him, and then how he was not negligent in all the things that he was doing and they couldn't find any, any base of accusation of whatever kind. But then verse here also writes this. In a verse 3, then this Daniel became distinguished above all the other high officials and such because of an excellent spirit that was in him. This excellent spirit You and I know it's the Holy Spirit that was living in him and then using him. You know, I used to think, okay, the reason why he was able to live uh, a life of integrity for not just for a short time, uh, at least about 60 some years, living in a public arena as a government official, uh, such a consistent, exemplary model of life, the key was because he had the Holy Spirit living inside of them. But the question that just came up to me was this. Uh, I know a lot of people that have Holy Spirit living inside of them, but they are not living this way. Do you know some? I know sometimes I myself find in their shoes. Uh, and then as I was looking at this passage more, now what is this? What am I to do? Should I just to just to bring guilt trip on myself and say, "Hey, I need to try better. I need to do, oh, oh, you know, the better job of becoming a, a more a, a model person." Is that what I need to do? But then verse ten gives a clue as to what really helped him to continue to live his life in this way. Verse ten. When Daniel knew that the document had been signed, he went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously, as he had done routinely, habitually. And then he was praying. I think... That is the key that helped Daniel to live in a consistent way. And I think that is the key that you and I need to learn today and reflect and then examine how you and I also can be used of God like Daniel, making a difference. There are a few things I want you to think together with me as we look at his prayer life. Daniel's prayer life. Daniel set aside time to have this prayer life because in God's presence he needed to be renewed. And then he needed to have his identity renewed and refreshed again and again and again. You know, uh, when my daughter was uh, growing up in about second grade, she came home one day and said, Dad, Mom, what am I? You know, I thought I was American. And then my teacher told me, I'm Korean. What am I? Am I Korean or American? I said, hey, you know, you are both Korean-American. But she said, I'm made in USA. I'm an American. I said, yes, you're made in USA, but, but you're also Korean. You know, you have a Korean ethnicity and then you're Korean-American. But what's more important is that you are a child of God and you're a Christian. You know about that. Our most important identity is not just your ethnicity, not just what you do, what people think that you may be, not where you live, what you have and what you have accomplished, what people think who you are, but what God thinks of you and what God tells you who you are. 
You're a child of God. You've been justified. You're Christ's friend. You belong to God. You're a member of Christ's body. And then all things will work together because you belong to Him. And you've been established, anointed, sealed by God. And then you can be confident that the work that He has begun will come to a fruition because He has begun. The good work. You're a citizen of heaven. You're hidden with Christ in God. And then on and on and on. And then so many things that in the scripture God reminds us who you are when you accepted Jesus. You became a child of God. You became his beloved. And then his eyes upon you. And then there's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. You're an heir with him. Seated together with him with all the spiritual blessings. The list continues on. But the thing is this. Sometimes we forget who we are. And then in the midst of even living for God, sometimes rather than living out who you are, you just do whatever that you need to do to just flow. Parker Palmer, in his book, A Hidden Wholeness, relates a story about a farmer in the Midwest who would prepare for blizzard by tying a rope from the back door of their house out to the barn as a guide to ensure they could return safely home. These blizzards came quickly and fiercely and were highly dangerous. And when their full force was blowing, a farmer could not see the end of his own hand. Many froze to death in those blizzards, disoriented by their inability to see. They wandered in circle, lost sometimes in their own backyard. If they lost their grip on the rope, it became impossible for them to find their way home. Some froze within feet of their own from door, never realizing how close they were to safety. To this day, parts of Canada and the Great Plains, meteorologists counsel people that to avoid getting lost in the blinding snow when they venture outside during this blizzard. They tie one end of a long rope to their house and grasp the other end firmly. Can you picture this? Blizzard. So many things that's happening in the world just ambushing you and just coming upon you and just taking control over your life to the point that you lose sight of who you are. So many things that you need to do at work. So many things that you need to do for the family. Even so many things that you need to do at church serving. In the midst of doing things even for God. You just get caught up in the midst of doing things. And then you lose the sight of why am I doing. And then is this what God is asking me. In a way that we're living in. Not inside out but outside in. Here, the reason why I think Daniel had this time every day, three times a day, in the midst of a pagan setting where he was working, he needed to have this sanctuary where he would come and be with God and behold God's face and worship Him and be in His presence. Sanctuary. You know, one of the things that really helped me to begin to have a deepening personal relationship with God was this. When I began to see God's face, the Father leaping over with joy over me and over you. And then when I began to see on the cross Jesus smiling at you even when you struggle. When you see Holy Spirit looking at your life and say, Fighting, keep up what you're doing, keep on doing what you're doing. 
Daniel means my God is my judge. From early on, the parents named him probably so that he will remember to live his life before God. God is my judge, not anybody else. But then as he was living before God, what was the most important thing that renewed him, reminded him, and then helped him to live in the midst of that setting was that he got to see Father who delights in him. God who has a big smile over you. And the Holy Spirit who is getting excited for what you are seeking to do. When you begin to see God and His face, when you begin to realize, yes, He loves me, not because of what I do. He loves me and He accepts me. In the midst of so many things that may pull you away, as you find yourself in His presence, as you learn to slow down and be before Him, gaze at His gaze, and you begin to know that He loves you, that you are His. And as you become anchored in His love, and as you learn to walk with Him, then you are able to live out your identity. Living before God's presence, having time, to be before Him, having the sanctuary. I'm talking not just about whether you're doing your quiet time, that's important, but as you're doing your quiet time, do not just read the Bible and say, oh, what am I supposed to do today? No. Take more time to slow down. Don't do quiet time for the sake of getting something and running out. Be before God and know that He loves you. Learn to grow in reciprocating love back to Him and so that you will grow and live as His beloved. First, I think through that time of prayer, time together with God, He was renewed. And the time that was necessary to detox the things that affect him, the relationship that needed to be renewed and cleansed and ref refreshed, whatever it may be, in that time that he was spending before God, I think he was again and again and again renewed so that he could live inside out. Second thing about his prayer life, I think, is that through his prayer time and time in prayer that he was building God's kingdom together with him. You know, let me try to go again to verse 5. And it reads like this. <clears throat> These men said, We shall find no ground for complaint against this Daniel unless we find it in connection with the law of his God. And then he, they went to the king and said, King, all the government officials, everybody, we came to agree that this is what needs to happen. Let's do this. You are such a great king. Let's make it a law that nobody can change so that everybody has to pray to you. Let's just pretend that you are like God for one month. And let's make that the most important law of the land. And that's what they did. Motivation behind? Because Daniel lived such an excellent way and there is nothing that they could find any fault except something that he was doing that is related to the law of his God. It's interesting. The verse before and then verse uh, four. Then the high officials and satraps ought to find a, a ground for complaint against Daniel with regard to the kingdom, but they could not find no ground. Uh, it's interesting here. The words kingdom comes and then law comes up. Now, Daniel was working for the kingdom. And then Babylon, now Medo-Persia, the kingdom. And then Daniel was working and doing that. But they, they realized there was nothing 
that they could find wrong with him the way that he worked, except they find Daniel with another law that he lives with of another kingdom. You see, Daniel was working for the kingdom of uh, Medo-Persia, but they knew and they noticed Daniel was living with the principles and law of another kingdom, and that is kingdom of God. You see, when they came and said, you know what? If you pray, anybody prays too, you know, anybody else except you, king, let's make sure that, that they will go through the, the most severe punishment in the whole world. Uh, what kind of law is that? And then if you just uh, yeah, pause a little bit and then think about it. You know, let's say uh, the new law is passed in Korea that you cannot pray. Uh, uh, to any other gods, uh, how would you respond? You would probably say, hey, you know, why, why don't I just uh, not go to my house and then pray in the regular way? I'll just walk outside and walk around and I'm going to do that and privately and then quietly and then nobody will know. And then, you know, unless uh, me living and not dying is more important and then, you know, perhaps I could just, uh, you know, the serve God in other ways or I know for sure the king is not real God. God, so you know the offering to the king doesn't mean anything. I'll just stay away and then save myself. Daniel didn't do it. When Daniel saw that these people were coming out against him, and then not just against him, in a way that all hell breaking loose because not just the state troops, not just the administrators, governors, and all the officials together came. Everybody united coming against him. And then, then they came and they knew how to do, work the system. And they talked together with a king who had authority and then puffed him up and then talked to him and treated him with respect to the point that now he had to sign a law that cannot be revoked. And now there is that sentence. And they all came out with everything that they're able to do against Daniel praying. Why is it that they got so focused on Daniel praying? We got to stop this man from praying. Probably because they noticed Daniel living an exemplary life, having a godly influence, even among so many people. Daniel knowing the truth and are able to speak to the king and then having their powerful influence. Daniel being the example and inspiration to so many other people that were in exile. And then Daniel having this power. They notice it's because of his daily habit of praying and spending time before God, and they knew that. A law that belongs to God's kingdom. That's what they said. And they noticed prayer is one of the key things about how God is using him building God's kingdom. How does that work? Prayer, you know. As we come before him and then as he invites us to be in his presence, converse together with him. And then in times of prayer, God cleanses, purifies, renews us, and then aligns us to be on the same page and begin to see things together. And then God also invites us as we spend more time talking, conversing together with him. That he begins to burden us to pray and through our words and utterance, God begins to unfold and accomplish things that no man can do. You see, he was praying three times a day, and then he had his 
window open toward Jerusalem. You know, what is the significance of Jerusalem? You know, 65 years before, the Jewish people leaders were taken from there into exile into Babylon. And they've been there for 65 years, but as they were coming, they were told the prophecy in 70 years that God will bring them back. God had Daniel there in that foreign pagan land, close to 65, almost to the full duration of that time, praying not so that, that the king in that country will be helped by God's hand and God will continue to have hand over that. That God will through him and his prayer continue to strengthen, prepare God's people. But as he's praying for Jerusalem, for the time to come, for God to bring back people and restore and rebuild the kingdom, he's been there praying toward Jerusalem, holding on to God's promise. Through his prayer, God working and God preparing and in time, God restoring and then bringing people back. So he was there praying the whole time. In fact, I think, yes, he was working for the kingdom of Babylon, Medo Persia, but in a deeper, more important way. His job was not just the prime minister. His job was not just the secretary. Important job for him was he was there as a servant of God, but as an intercessor, together with his prayer, building God's kingdom. You know, what's also more important about praying for Jerusalem is this as he was praying for the restoration of rebuilding of Jerusalem, God began to open, not just about how God's going to rebuild that Jerusalem, but new Jerusalem that will not be shaken through the coming of the Son of Man, the Messiah. And where he was on his knees, he was praying and preparing for Jesus is coming and he was praying for new Jerusalem through Jesus' work that will come down. And then he was praying for the rest of the human history and that's what we see. You know, here, we're reminded God is inviting you and me to have this time to be his presence so that you will receive his love, be anchored in his love and live as his child. That's more important than anything else. But as you are spending time conversing, talking together with him, as you begin to pray for your family, as you begin to pray for people that you work with, as you begin to pray for the children that you teach, as you begin to pray for many other friends, you will begin to see God through your prayers, yes, your prayers, and through my prayer, that God will work and building kingdom that cannot be Shake it. As I was thinking about it, I couldn't help but to notice sometimes a, a picture. You know, when my daughter was young, like two, three years old, and then going to a grocery store, coming back, and then she said, Dad, let me help you carry this grocery with you. I'm like, please, you're not much of help, but let me, please help, help, I want to help. And then you have to let her carry one side and then you hold the other side. But with your hand, you really hold her so that she can hold it so that we can carry the bag together. Why is God inviting you and me to pray? Is it not? Because God is inviting you to partner with Him so that through your prayers that He wants to make a difference in the lives of people. And he is inviting you to partner with him in prayer. There's a gentleman named James Fraser and wrote a book 
called the Mountain Rain. I read it when I was in college. He's an OMF missionary. was serving among the Li Su tribe in the southwestern part of China at the turn of uh, last century. And he was there. He was the one that uh, gave them an alphabet for that tribe. And then he was there faithfully serving. After serving about close to 10 years, he came to realize there is another tribe, Li Su people, further away. The people that he was serving, working for, serving was a southern tribe and there was a northern tribe. When he met somebody from a northern tribe and then he spent about a week or two trying to share the gospel and disciple him and taught him everything that he can do to teach this man when he was going back. When he went back, his ministry began to change. In the morning, he would get up and spend up to the lunchtime, noontime, praying for the northern tribe of Lisu people that he didn't get to see. But then from noon on, then he was doing his best to minister to the people. After another 10 years or so, and then with you know, God blessing the ministry, he had more than 100 people that came to know Jesus Christ, and the church was growing, and the ministry was prospering. But somehow he found out about what was happening in northern tribe. He heard the man that he disciples sent back went and shared the gospel. And then God began to work in a powerful way. And there was more than a thousand people in that tribe in the northern part. He spent morning time praying in the afternoon, rest of the day, ministry. And then basically, the book was reminding us, yes, when we work, we work. But when God invites us to pray, God works. You see, Daniel was here. His most important job was not being the government official. He could care less what title that he had, but he was there praying for God's people to be strengthened, renewed, for God's work to take place. He was praying so that the Messiah that is to come will come for God's purpose to take place. Yes, in time of prayer, I hope that you and I will spend more time set aside receiving God's love, being anchored and learn to live inside out. But that you will also learn to pray. Learn to pray. You may not be profession, but learn to pray. Like a little kid, let me help you. Yes, he's waiting for you to pray so that through your prayer that God will bring changes where he has placed you. One more thing. Through times of prayer, God helped, to, helped him to have hope, find hope in the midst of difficulties. You know, the test came, and then these people came, the soldiers came. You know, back then the windows were not made with big windows that people could see. It was usually a, a little, you know, opening toward the you know, top of the, the, the room and so that the light will come in. And then people cannot see unless they peek in. And then people cannot really see what's going on inside unless they've been snooping and then unless the secret police come and look for them. And then they knew that they, Daniel would not stop praying so they sent their secret police and then capture him and then came to the king and said look king Daniel does not have regard for you look he's the worst criminal he's a public enemy number one and then we need to kill him and because you signed the law and then there is no turning back you cannot change your mind and then he is doomed all the law most important law of the land not condemn him for violating. And now they took him and now king had to say yes and threw him into the lion's den. And there he went. 
But interesting thing is, even when he knew the injunction, the document was signed, and then Daniel was not so surprised, and he was not scared that, now what am I going to do when I'm going to get whipping, or when I get thrown into the lions, then what's going to happen? It seemed like he was at peace. And then he was trusting in God. He knew that in the midst of the difficulties that he went through, that God was faithful and then he came through again and again. When the king said, you're going to all die, and then they didn't die because God came through. In the midst of more serious, difficult challenges, God was there together, and then God came through. You see that it's very similar. What happened here, and then what Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego uh, experienced and went through was very similar. And they're captured, and now they are sentenced in the midst of suffering and in the midst of death that they are going to experience. Angel came and delivered. But what they said was interesting. What Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego said was, Yes, we know that our God is able to strengthen, encourage, and deliver us in the midst of whatever situation it may be. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to. We're not going to denounce him. Yes, he knew. Daniel, I think, knew. That God is able to help. But, but, even if he dies, he knew that's not the real end. There is life after death with God. What you see here is not everything. And that's what he knew. In the midst of difficulty, he knew that God is able to come through, and he does come through, because he is faithful. But even if he does not come through, and even if he loses his life here, that's not the end. Like Paul says, for me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But what's striking also is the story here is similar to another story you see verse 16 the king commanded the daniel to be brought and cast into the den of lion king declared to daniel may your god whom you serve continually deliver you and a stone was brought and laid over covering the mouth of the den and the king sealed it and with his own sickness, and then nothing might change concerning Daniel, because there is a sentence, death sentence. But you know what? You know the other story, how God intervenes, how the stone is rolled away, and then how the person who was condemned to die receives life and lives on. But you know what? Look here. When the king came and talked to Daniel, and Daniel, Daniel, are you okay? And this is what he says. Verse 22, My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths, and they had not harmed me because I was found blameless before God. And before you, O king. You see, Daniel was condemned with the law of the world. And he was condemned. But then, there, Daniel stood in the midst of a place of death. He stood before a God who is reigning at a higher court. And then God declared him innocent. Interesting thing, not just innocent before God, but innocent before the king that whom that God placed Daniel to serve. And Daniel was innocent before God, innocent before king, and God 
gives them new life. This is an Old Testament picture of resurrection that foreshadows another person like Daniel thrown into a place like lion's den who was ripped, torn, and went through death. And because of his death, as you and I, who is to stand before condemnation, stand before God, and is declared innocent and given eternal life here. Well, what I'm trying to say here is this. Daniel knew. God is faithful and God is able and God loves us and God comes through. But even after this life ends, life with God goes on. And that is the real life. Another missionary story. There's a, a gentleman uh, named Henry Morrison. And then he's been serving in Africa uh, for 40 years. And then he was coming back to New York area on the same ship where Teddy Roosevelt went for three weeks of a safari game. And then he and his wife rode on the same ship coming back together. Months before he wrote a letter telling his friends and then his church people, Hey, we're coming home. We're coming home. I wonder how your kids are. I wonder how things are with people back at home and on. And then we're so excited. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen, what to do. But, but we're coming home because our time is up. And then as they were coming near, and then was thinking, oh, will anybody be there to welcome us back, welcome us home? As the ship was coming near, he, they heard a little noise, some kind of a music playing, and as they looked and saw that there was some kind of a band playing music, and then as it was coming closer, there was a red carpet, and then balloon and a big banner, Welcome home! And then he got excited. All oh, the people get to receive our letter, and then soon as he was coming, it was not a welcome for him, or them, but it was welcome for the Ted Roosevelt. He was coming back from his three-week trip. And then he was so discouraged. So discouraged. And then God, what's going on? This man came for three weeks hunting, coming back, and so many people are rejoicing and welcoming. And then we gave our lives for 40 years, we faithfully served, coming back, nobody. What's going on? And then his wife told him, Honey, I think you need to go downstairs and talk to the father. And after some time, he came back up with a smile in his face and said, What did God say to you? And he said, You know, when I said, God, this is not fair. What's going on? Where is justice? And God says, Son, you're not coming home yet. When you come home, there will be a bigger reception waiting for you. It is true, is it not? In the midst of so much that we need to do, we tend to lock our eyes on only things that you see. But Daniel was able to see beyond this life, to see eternity. And he was able to serve faithfully. Through his times of prayer, he was renewed. His identity renewed so that he is able to continue to live as a child of God, as a servant of the Most High King. And then through his prayers, 
He was building God's kingdom that cannot be shaken in the lives of people. And through his prayers, he was able to see beyond the suffering, difficulty, and persecution and see eternity. I read another person, uh, I'm talking about, about a lot of people today, but this gentleman who's serving as a president of a large Christian educational institute. Because he wants to live every day in light of eternity. He said his work table is clear with a pencil and pen and then word processor and everything else clear. Except on the one side he has a model of human skull there. Because he wants to be reminded every day. When life leaves me, that's me. But today God has given life for me so that I may live today investing eternity in the lives of people that God has placed in my life. I hope that you and I will be like Daniel. Dare to be like Daniel where God has placed you. Let us pray. I'm not trying to put guilt trip on you that you're not praying hard enough, long enough. No. But it's an invitation. As you learn to slow down and make time, make room, you will experience God flooding you, pouring His love, and then renewing you and your soul so that you will live as God's child. Through your prayers, small prayers, God's listening. As you pray, God will open your eyes to see beyond what you see physically. Lord Jesus, we pray you will help us so that we may learn to slow down and spend our time together with you so that we may learn to live inside out so that we may learn to build eternal kingdom so that we may live with eternity in view today and every day. Help us, Lord, we pray. Strengthen and encourage all of us, we pray, so that we can be used of you as Daniel, where you have placed us. In Jesus' name, amen.